As you know, I play a lot of strategy games. I've played board games, I've played strategy RPGs, and obviously I've played a ton of Advance Wars. When I think about what game series started it all for me, what led me to the genre of strategy games to begin with, my mind immediately thinks of the series that made the entire genre of strategy RPGs as big as it is now. A series that stood out for many, many reasons. A series that has gone through a lot, especially in the last few years. And that series is from the same people who brought you Metroid, Paper Mario, WarioWare, Tetris Attack, and of course, Advance Wars. <sighs> What you just saw was the commercial for Fire Emblem, Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light, the first in a long, long-running series of strategy role-playing games by Nintendo's close affiliate, Intelligent Systems. That course arguably marks the beginning of a genre. Strategy RPGs did exist already, in such forms as Koei's The Dragon and Princess, or Bokosuka Wars, where units leveled up in a similar fashion as Fire Emblem. However, Fire Emblem was the first to really make a breakthrough and make the genre big, all while standing out as one of the most inventive, unique, and epic war stories of the time. It's high time I do this series the justice it deserves. So here I am, reviewing the series that gave me my username. Now before we get started, let's get one thing straight. This series concerns only the 15 mainline Fire Emblem games released at the time of this writing. I haven't played Tokyo Mirage Sessions, I haven't played Heroes or Warriors or any other weird spin-offs I may have missed. I also haven't played the Birthright or Revelation stories of Fire Emblem Fates, though that may change. But there are a few odd games I can let you in on, we'll get to that as we go. For now, let's look at the one that started it all, Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light. I mean, the title screen says it right there, right? In the beginning, there was the Dark Dragon, the Falchion Sword, and some really, really bad English. Fire Emblem is a tactical RPG starring a prince named Mars, or Marth as he's known outside of Japan. His name comes from the Roman God of War, naturally. He and his knights have gone into exile after his country's allies betray him in the decisive battle in the war against a dark dragon named Medius and his dark priest Garneth. And why wouldn't Marth get betrayed? He doesn't even wear pants in battle! In this tactical war game, you'll deploy your characters of varying classes, each of which wield one or more different types of weapons, across a 25-map campaign while a story of love, war, and child soldiers unfolds. No incest yet, apparently. Combat mechanics utilize very simple stat calculations to determine accuracy and damage, although the game doesn't display weapon stats or show any sort of combat preview. Your goal on every map is to get Marth to seize the goal point, usually a castle or throne inside a castle. Basically, imagine Famicom Wars, except you control RPG characters that gain experience and level up when they fight, with different weapons and equipment you can purchase and use in battle. There are a number of classes to find in the game. Horsemen, archers, swordsmen, pirates, mages, armored knights, knights on dragons, knights on winged ponies, and even some utility units. Thieves can open doors and chests, and clerics can heal and cast other spells on your allies. One of the later characters is a little girl that turns into a giant dragon and breathes fire. Beware the children in Fire Emblem. And every character you recruit has a name, portrait, and unique stats, although presumably due to cartridge limitations, some of them reuse portraits, and many of the characters are men and women a few words. There are a lot of characters in this game, some of which you can even recruit out of the enemy army by having your characters engage in conversation, not combat. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out who needs to do the talking. Sometimes the game is a touch more obvious about it. Though you probably won't even use all the, these characters because the number of enemies on each of the 25 maps in this game is not infinite. There are arenas where you can risk money and lives on additional fights, but you actually have to ration the EXP you gain. 
pile it all on one unit and the rest of your army ends up underleveled in the later parts of the game, try to distribute it evenly and you're not going to have very many strong units for the end game. You also have to manage your inventory carefully. Weapons in this game wear down and eventually break with use, requiring you to make the most out of each weapon and keep a healthy stock handy. Some weapons are exceedingly rare and need to really be conserved for when you need them. Stock management can be, well, not difficult. The main character can visit villages and extort money out of the people, so you never really have to worry that much about money. The issue is inventory management. Most maps have a storage tent that acts as an item bank you can send purchases to, but if a unit hasn't been selected for the current map, you have no way of getting to their stuff and you can't take it before or after a battle. Units also aren't able to exchange items with each other, they can only give items to other units, which leads to spending several turns rearranging their inventories so that you have an optimal setup for the next map. It's kind of annoying. But we could really use some quality of life improvements here. You also have the ability to change the class of your units. Uh, this is referred to as a promotion because it's similar to how a pawn promotes in chess, although the game never actually refers to it as such, it just calls it a class change. Units level 10 or above can use a special item to upgrade their class. Uh, this raises the stats of the unit to match the base of the new class if they aren't, weren't already that high, and when mages or clerics promote, they can use a new kind of weapon. They also return to level 1 so they can, t can continue gaining levels and stats. Not all units can promote, in fact the main character is one such unit that cannot promote, but the stat gains typically aren't much of an upgrade anyhow. All stats other than HP cap at 20, and getting close to that cap isn't really that difficult. One of Fire Emblem's more frustrating ideas is that whenever a unit levels up, the stat bonuses are actually randomized. Each character has a different chance of gaining a particular stat at level up, and you're never allowed to know what that chance is unless you look it up online. When a new character joins your army, you're tasked with figuring out whether they're worth long-term use or not by handing them a few kills and seeing if their stats are worth it, although bad luck can also lead to gimped stats. Maybe that's one of the reasons there are so many characters, in case one of them ends up with really poor stats. Well, actually, there's another reason there are so many characters, and it's the one mechanic that makes Fire Emblem stand out tremendously, even to this day. I'll say it up front, character death in Fire Emblem is permanent. There's no such thing as a phoenix down in this game. Barring a single-use revival item found at the very end of the game, any character that dies is just gone. Only way to get them back is to restart the map, and if the main character dies, you must do this. And this is potentially very frustrating, as one enemy getting a critical hit or evading one too many attacks can get a character you care about killed in an instant. Even with plenty of potential replacements, there's also the rare chance of the player simply not being able to continue the game at all if all their characters and weapons are gone. Then again, maybe that's intentional. Death and hardship are the cruel realities of war after all. It's pretty ballsy to put that in a game. Most games these days wouldn't dare include something like that. It'd be seen as far too much of a punishment for a mistake. In fact, it probably is considering you might lose a character needed to recruit somebody later on. The first Fire Emblem isn't that difficult for a series veteran like me, but I can see a new player struggling with this quite a bit, and it's rather telling that the newer games actually give you the option of turning off permanent death entirely. Speaking of over-punishing mistakes, one of the other potential hurdles is the final boss, Medius himself. While that sounds like a no-shit statement, let's break this down. Medius has 35 physical defense and is immune to magic and bows. His status screen says he has 15 defense, but that's actually not counting the bonus for being a dragon. Uh, the only reasonable way to scratch that is with the legendary Falchion, a weapon that triples in damage against Medius and is usable only by Mark. To get the Falchion, you have to kill Garnif, who stole it, and he's immune to everything but the Starlight spell, and that can only be attained by bringing the Star and Light orbs to the Sage Goto. So if you lost the orb, pass the chapter with Goto without getting Starlight, or have no mage to cast it, you ain't getting your stinking Falchion and face a much worse alternative. Relying on either the Gradivus, a weapon limited in use, 
or the Devil Axe, which can sometimes backfire and damage his wielder instead. I mean, jeez. Aren't you kind of pushing this a little too much? You're expecting the player to always, always get Starlight and always get Falchion, but sometimes people just make mistakes or they just don't restart the chapter. It's insane. There are also a number of strange design choices exclusive to the first game. For example, a cleric doesn't get experience points for casting their healing spells. They can't attack either unless they promote to a bishop. So what does the game do? It gives them experience points for tanking hits. Yeah, how can you expect a cleric to tank a hit? I don't know, but I generally don't worry about it anyways because all the clerics in this game have terrible stats anyhow. Uh, their spells are amazing though. If you get a warp staff, you can teleport any character to any tile on the map. You could send Marth straight to the chapter goal and win the battle in an instant. Of course, Warp has limited uses, balancing out how overpowered this is. Kinda, sorta. Okay, not really, it's overpowered, but still. Other odd mechanics include weapon level being a numerical stat that is useless to increase past 10 or so, bridges that require a special key to cross, stat boosters being overpowered and even purchasable, as well as magic dealing fixed amounts of damage because magic isn't increased by the strength stat, and 99% of the characters and enemies have zero magic resistance unless you cast the barrier spell or use pure water or a talisman. There's even an item that damages everything on the map, both sides when used. The original Fire Emblem is one of the most inventive games I've ever seen. It had so many wonderful new ideas back then and pulled it all off actually pretty well. This game has unfortunately not aged all that well, like Famicom Wars. The computer is very slow in making its moves, and the animations are long and can only be shortened slightly. Those of you emulating this will want to abuse the shit out of the turbo button. In addition, as stated, several mechanics and design choices can feel very primitive at times, and a good number of the maps can feel very boring, bland, or not that well thought out. However, I can appreciate the original game for paving the way for an amazing franchise, and it sold very well. Well enough to warrant the sequel, which I'll be covering next. And as was common for the time, this sequel tries going in a completely different direction with iffy results.